There are 252 town meeting members, 127 constitutes a quorum. The constable informs me that a quorum is present. The fourth session of the 256th annual town meeting will now come to order. Quick schedule review, sessions five and six are next week, Monday the 12th, Wednesday the 14th. Seven and eight if necessary are Monday the 19th, Wednesday the 21st. Then there's another session scheduled for Wednesday, May 28th if necessary. And then we will certainly be coming back on Monday, June 2nd, because we've moved some articles to that date. A couple reminders from the moderator. The first night you checked in, you received your packet of red and green tally vote cards to be used for the duration of town meeting. Please remember to bring your cards in the future. If you forgot your cards, you can get a blank set from the check-in table. You must write your name and precinct number on each card. Tally vote cards without names will not be counted. Seats on the floor of the auditorium may be occupied only by town meeting members except for the front row, which may be used by members of the press or by members of town committees and staff participating in presentation or discussion of articles. Such persons must wear non-voter stickers available at the check-in table. The seats in the front row of this section in front of me are reserved for those who are on deck. If the next article is one that you will be presenting on or expect to be questioned on, you may come forward and sit in one of these seats. The seats in front of me on the right are tonight occupied by the school committee, the superintendent and staff, and the staff from town manager's office, since the first items are on our agenda are the elementary and regional school budgets. Finance committee is seated to my left. Spectators and residents who are not town meeting members may be seated in the bleachers to the rear of the auditorium. New information can be found on the back table to my left by the check-in table. Old information, back table to my right. Amherst Media provides gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of our proceedings on public access channel 17. I'd like to thank their staff and volunteers. Videos of town meeting sessions are replayed frequently and can also be viewed on the Amherst Media website. The first printing of the League of Women Voters annual publication, They Represent You, is available on the new, on, I think it was probably moved to the old information table, um, but I'm not sure about that. The first draft is an unfolded legal size printed sheet. It is a list of all elected officials in Amherst and their contact information. If there is an error or omission in your listing, please send in your corrections by Monday, May 19th. Please note that there has been a change in the online correction form for this document. There will be a flyer with the correct information on the back table tonight. This announcement is also going out by email from the TMCC. If you wish to speak, you must raise a hand and be recognized. When appropriate, please hold up a green or red card to indicate pro or con on an issue. When you're called on, please first state your name and precinct. If you forget, I will interrupt and ask you to do so. If you need more than three minutes or more than five when speaking to your motion, you must request additional time before speaking, and town meeting will vote on your request. If you're speaking from the floor, please speak into a microphone that will be provided once you are recognized. This will allow viewers outside the auditorium to hear you. The microphone will be on when it is handed to you. Please hold it close to your mouth when you speak. Non-members who wish to speak should stand at the rear of the right-hand aisle, the one in front of me. Any registered voter of the town of Amherst who is recognized by the moderator may speak without special permission. Others may speak with the permission of the majority. If you're making an amendment to a motion, the amendment must be presented in writing with four copies submitted to the following people, town clerk, moderator, town manager or staff, and chair of the finance committee or whichever board is seated to my left. Copy machine is located at the end of the table to my right. This may be used to make copies of amendments. Procedural motions, such as a motion to refer or a motion to dismiss, do not need to be presented in writing. If you are making an amendment to a portion of the operating budget, please specify the dollar amount greater or less than the amount in the Finance Committee motion. If you make any motion from the floor, it must be the first thing you do after you have been recognized and have identified yourself. You cannot speak first and then make a motion. A reminder to turn your cell phone off. It's very embarrassing if you leave it on, so turn it off. Um, so we didn't get started till 7.13 tonight which means 13 minutes that all the people who came on time or early had to wait. So I would ask everybody to really work hard at getting here before 7 o'clock, get checked in so we can start right at 7 o'clock. It adds up. If we lose 15 minutes a night, it can add up to a significant chunk of time by the end. So please do your best out of respect to everybody else who is getting here on time to try and be here on time.
town meeting coordinating committee will be holding elections during the fifth town meeting session on May 12th. Um, there are four candidates running for these positions. I'm now going to read their names and their candidate statements. Margaret Roberts, her statement is, providing information in many ways to town meeting members has been my goal as a member of TMCC. Working for informed participation in town meeting and improvements to help sessions of our legislative body work well, I hope to continue helping you in your job as a member of town meeting. Nani Borak, if you re-elect me, I shall continue with my efforts to render town meeting as smooth and pleasurable as possible. Mary Streeter, I would like to continue working diligently to improve openness and communication for town meeting members and the public. I have organized events, managed listservs, provided support for new members, and helped increase documents on the town website to encourage informed decision making. I would appreciate your vote. And the fourth candidate is actually, did not have the nomination papers in on time, but will be a write-in candidate, and I'm reading her statement as well. And this is Melissa Perot. It is a privilege to work with this experienced committee as it constantly seeks to improve communication and accessibility to critical information for town meeting members so they can be ready to represent their precinct on important economic and social issues for the town of Amherst. I would be happy to continue serving. Thank you to the four candidates who are running. And the election will be in our next session, session five, and you'll need to cast your vote by nine o'clock in that session. So after you come early, you'll have time to cast your vote before the meeting starts. If at any point in time you're confused about proceedings, it is appropriate to call a point of order and ask for a clarification. It is also always okay to phone me, send me an email, or see me prior to town meeting if you need an explanation of any kind. We now have two procedural motions that I've been notified about. The first is from Mr. Schreiber on the planning board. Steve Schreiber, Steve Schreiber Vice Chair of the Planning Board, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 9. I Just speak right into the mic. I move to consider Articles 25 through 30, beginning at 7.05 p.m. on Monday, May 12th. Do I hear a second? I hear a second, you may speak to your motion. The reasons are twofold, that by hearing the zoning articles as a bundle. Keep the mic close ah, to me. Yeah. The zoning art, if we hear, uh, this will guarantee that we can hear the zoning articles as a bundle, they're interrelated, so that's important. The other thing is that there's a high degree of citizen and of course town meeting interest in the zoning articles and to have a predictable schedule will make it more easy for those to attend on time on Monday. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? This is a majority vote, and if you vote yes, then basically we will begin um, Monday, May 12th with, the, with Article 25 and do 25 through 30, and then after that pick up wherever we left off. I see no hands, so we will come to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. The ayes have it, so that procedural motion has passed. And now I recognize Ms. Gregg for a procedural motion. And can we get a microphone over there? I'm Nancy Gregg, co-chair of the Housing and Sheltering Committee and I'm waiting to see my motion up there. You can all see it now. Yep. Can you make it a make it, it a tiny be bit bigger. bigger? Beautiful. Thank you. Ms. I move I move to consider Article thirty four at seven oh five on Wednesday, May fourteenth. 
So I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. We would, we would just prefer to do that article at that point. Um. <laughs> any, any elaboration there? Any elaboration? Well, some other of the zoning things would have gone through, and uh, hopefully it would make a, a difference for us. Okay, so th in order to follow the zoning articles was the reason, really. Sound reasonable? Okay. Um, is there any discussion before we come to a vote? Yes, I see a hand back there. Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Um, I, w I, I move that the request uh, that was just made refer to um, Monday, May 19th, rather than Wednesday, May 14th. I'm... Okay, I, I'll explain why I make... I'm no, but why hang on a second. got to think about that because I'm not gonna allow you to make a subsidiary motion to a procedural motion. After this one passes, I can recognize you to make another procedural motion to move it to a different point in time, but I don't want, I'm not gonna allow a second procedural motion tagged on as a subsidiary mm -hmm. to the first. M may I then speak against the motion that's on the yes, floor? Yes, you may. Okay. Um, as, as some in the town meeting know, um, there is a conservation commission hearing at 7.30 next Wednesday uh, evening and scheduled, unfortunately, at the same time the town meeting is scheduled on the retreat proposal. Um, and I don't think the town meeting members should have to choose between attending, and, and a very large number attended the the preliminary subdivision hearing that was conducted by the planning board a number of months ago. And I don't think we should be put in the position of having to choose uh, between coming to town meeting and attending a hearing about a project that I think um, is like a really important one for the town and that has really devastating, will have a very devastating impact on literally all of North Amherst. So I would beg the town meeting to, to not vote for the, the motion that's on the floor, and I, I would be happy to support a motion for, um, for Monday, um, May 19th, enthusiastically supported. Um, I would just like to point out before seeing if there's more discussion that even if this article isn't moved to Wednesday, May 14th, we are scheduled for town meeting to meet on Wednesday, May 14th. This is just saying this one would be first versus something else being first. So yes or no on this does not change the fact that there's a scheduled town meeting on Wednesday, May 14th. Is there further discussion before we come to a vote on the procedural motion to move Article 34? I see no hands. We now come to a vote. A majority vote is what we need here. All those in favor of the motion to move Article 34 to Wednesday, May 14th, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Um, I'm going to call for a vote again because I felt that some people were not in using their sort of modulated normal voice. So um, let's have another voice vote on that, but everybody try in a same smooth tone, not too yelly or anything. All those in favor of moving Article 34 to Wednesday, May 14th, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. no. <sighs> Moderators in doubt, um, which means we have to have a counted vote. So can I have the tellers up here real quickly? All those who are voting yes on the motion to move Article 34 to May 14th, please rise and remain standing.
Thank you. In the center, there are 12 yes votes. In the center, you may be seated. Looks like you beat me to it. On the left, there are 15 yes votes. On the right, there are 35 yes votes. I'm sorry, on the left, you may be seated. On the right, you may be seated. All those opposed to the procedural motion to move Article 34 to May 14th, please stand and remain standing. On the right, there are 15 no votes. You may be seated on the right. On the left, there are 31 no votes. You may be seated on the left. There are 34 no votes in the center. You may be seated in the center. The yes votes are 62. The no votes are 80. This procedural motion has failed. We will continue to hear Article 34 at its normally scheduled time. Um, Mr. O'Connor, do you need are you making a procedural motion or you need to be recognized for one? Um, I'm con I don't know if the committee. Identify yourself, please. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Um, um, is it, would it be possible to make this procedural motion next Monday if we haven't reached Article 34? Um, a procedural motion can be made any night you want. Okay, so thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would have been a point, that's a legitimate point of order. Um, any questions before we continue? Point of order? Yes. Um, wait for a microphone, please. Ms. Riddle. <coughs> Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. Uh, what happens to the uh, special town meeting, the zoning article, Article 24, on June 2nd? Um, nothing happens to it. It's already been procedurally moved till June 2nd. And that wasn't part of this procedural motion. This was 25 through 30. OK, we now move on to the elementary school portion of the fiscal year 2015 budget. And before we begin, I am recognizing our superintendent for a presentation.
Thank you very much. Um, if I may ask for an additional three minutes, the moderator. Um, without objection, it is granted. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Moderator, members of town meeting and the Amherst community. It's a pleasure to speak with you this evening regarding the state of the elementary and the regional schools. Our schools are richly diverse in ever-changing learning communities. 50% of our elementary students and 38% of our secondary students identify as students of color. 14% of our elementary students and 4% of our secondary students are English language learners and over 40 languages are spoken in our schools. 19% of our elementary and secondary students require specialized instruction through special education. 38% of our elementary students and 27% of our secondary students are income eligible. As a public school system, we welcome each student who joins us and we strive to recognize their interests, their strengths, and their needs. Our goal is to support students in envisioning their future selves and to provide them a strong educational experience so that they can grow into a well-educated, socially competent young adult who develops a strong voice, a love of learning, and who positively contributes to our world. To this end, we strive to provide a wide range of learning experience, experiences and extracurricular opportunities that mirror our students' interests and reflect the community's values. Students choose courses ranging from AP Calculus to Advanced Art Portfolio. Participate in a wide variety of clubs that reflect their interests and beliefs, such as People of Color United, Best Buddies, the Environmental Action Club, LGBTQ and Friends, and Latinos Unidos, those to name a few. And they complete, compete and play in an impressive array of athletics, from ultimate frisbee to football. Our students are passionate and involved, dedicating their time to ser service learning activities, artistic performances, and community engagement. They impress us with their fortitude, persistence, compassion, and social consciousness. And although they were routinely recognized locally and across the state for their accomplishments, many of our students engage in courses and extracurricular activities just for the experience of broadening their world. A few accomplishments to note tonight are, our students hosted this year the, the National Minority Student Achievement Network Student Conference. They won the WGBY Together in Song Choral Competition. They were accepted to the prestigious Young Writers Conference at the Bread Loaf. They won the National Gold Medal in Drawing in the Art, Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, and they won first place in the Massachusetts Indoor Track and Field for Division II. The world in which we're launching our young adults is rapidly changing, and the expectation for our schools must evolve to keep up with these realities. We're preparing students today to live in a world that we cannot fully imagine. In addition to these changes, the state and federal mandates are continually increasing. Being a teacher in the public schools today requires a commitment to lifelong learning, collaborative skills, and the dedication to self-reflection and professional growth. This is an extremely challenging profession. Schools have engaged in the essential necessary changes to meet these challenges, and we have much more work to do. A few areas that I'd like to note are we're focused on providing an aligned, coherent curriculum and an improved instructional model. We've implemented new elementary and middle school mathematics curriculum and elementary science and social studies units. This coming year, we'll focus on reviewing and revising social studies in various grades, high school mathematics, and our early literacy programs. In addition, we'll implement an arts integration model at our, at our elementary schools so that our content comes alive. We're also strengthening our special education model and mental health programming for students at all levels with particular emphasis at the high school. <coughs> Instructionally, our focus is on implementing the principles of universal design in our classrooms to create multiple access points to lessons, to create varied tasks and act activities for our students, and to provide multiple ways of demonstrating what has been learned. In addition, we're expanding co-teaching models so that the learning environment becomes more accessible to our diverse learners. 
we have and we continue to re review and adjust how we use our time during our day. We're providing before and after school programming and we've eliminated our early release Wednesday so that our students have full five days of instruction at our elementary schools. Currently, we're exploring a change in our high school schedule. We're implementing multiple strategies to improve our school climate. We've begun implementing a culturally responsive framework to improve school climate in our elementary and middle schools, which explicitly teaches school expectations and supports staff with positive strategies and age-appropriate behavioral interventions. We will be starting this work at the high school this coming year. We are in the process of revising our code of conducts. We will implement restorative practices and take the opportunity to provide educational in interventions to expand and improve our responses to student behavior. In addition, we have begun and will expand the opportunities for our students to take a leadership role in our schools. I don't know what to do about that sound. Um, through mentoring programs, through training active bystanders, through dialogue groups, and through administering climate surveys and developing and implementing student-generated action plans. Toward enhancing our systemic approach to family engagement, we opened the doors to the ARPS Family Center this year, which is designed to provide a welcoming, supportive environment for our families to connect with our schools, particularly those families who have been historically underserved. Our family, has made great, our family center has made great strides in reaching out to our families through a variety of programs such as Family University, Juntos We Play, Steps to Success, and through partnerships with Family Outreach of Amherst. The professional development of our teaching staff is directly related to the priorities of our students. We will focus this year on universal design in our classrooms, on co-teaching, and on the continued development of our cross-cultural competence. The format will pr be primarily through embedded professional development at the school level and through collegial dialogue. The strategies that I've referenced are represented in our district and school improvement plans for the coming year, and they're directly linked to our budget priorities. Our continued work is to develop an educational program that meets the needs of our students, that maintains the comprehensive programming, and that is financially viable over time. That is a substantial challenge. Tonight, we'll present budgets to the Amherst for the Amherst and Regional Schools that include programs and services that are essential to the students sitting in our classrooms right now that represents the values of our community and represents the values of our community. We've worked diligently to develop budgets that meet the needs of our schools while respecting the fiscal realities that we face. As a result, our regional budget this year comes in at a 1.8% increase overall and a 2.37% increase in the assessment to Amherst. This is roughly $77,000 under the 2.7 target provided by the town of Amherst. Our Amherst budget shows a 2.2% increase and is $100,000 under the percentage increase determined by the Finance Committee. So thank you as always for your unwavering support of public education. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be recognizing um, Ms. Tylen for the motion, but before that, I'd like to recognize her just to speak a bit about the budget process. Okay. Over the uh, last several years, town meeting has been receiving uh, more information about the schools. So I was curious about you know, where we were in 2010 as to where we are now. And in 2010, you all received three pages about the schools, and today, in this booklet, you received eight. Since uh, my focus on the Finance Committee is on the schools, I've watched the development and the budget process. Um, and in 2010, this is the format that was used for a $20 million budget. This is what the schools are providing us today, which is a much bigger budget. <coughs> and that has been done under the present administration with Maria Garrett. So I'd like to thank them for providing us with so much more information uh, about the schools and certainly those charts that are in your finance report come from the schools. So now I'd go forward and ask okay. for two extra minutes. Okay, well, so first, no, the next thing, I'm just going to recognize you to make the motion, 
under the elementary school portion of the budget. Okay, and two which, extra minutes? Which is, hang on, not quite yet. Oh, soon. after that, all right. <laughs> I'm not following First the just script. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I move that the town raise and appropriate $21,490,563 for the Amherst Elementary Schools. I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. Would you like an additional two minutes? Two minutes, please. <laughs> Without objection, you may continue. <laughs> okay. Um, the Finance Committee voted to support and recommend this amount for the Amherst Elementary School budget by a vote of four to zero to two. One was absent and one was abstaining because of a potential conflict of interest. The Amherst Elementary School budget begins on page 36 of your Finance Committee report. So if you have that, would be helpful as I talk to, to follow that. Um, on March 18th, the Amherst School Committee voted a budget of $22,482,907 for a difference of $992,344. Well, I'm sure you noticed that as you read your uh, report. Um, and uh, it is an accounting issue and one which Mr. Pooler, the finance direct, town finance director, will explain after my presentation. Page 36 of the Finance Committee report, uh, in the left-hand column you'll see the payroll and expense accounts, and this page does not reflect any capital items uh, because those are in the JCPC report. Um, in the FY15 column at the bottom of the page toward the right is the Amherst School Committee uh, vote uh, for next year's budget. Now, if town meeting approves of the Finance Committee's uh, recommendation for the budget, this page will be uh, adjusted to reflect the recommendations of, or the recommendation of the Finance Committee. Under either budget uh, figure, the school budget came in at 100,000 less than the Finance Committee budget guidelines. And if you turn to page uh, uh, 39, you'll see uh, the additions and reductions that the schools have made. Okay. Could I have the chart on the uh, board, please? Okay. No, that's not the one. <laughs> there we go. Regula uh, re regular education has gone down since FY06 from 39.55% to 34.49% this year, and it will go down slightly in FY15 by 1.17%. Special education goes down slightly by 0.23%, and administrative services will go up slightly due to adjustments in allocations in the central office as some central office staff assignments have changed within the three districts. There's a minor reduction in transportation. Health insurance has gone up since FY06. It will go down, it will go down slightly next year. Overall health insurance rates have stabilized due to a very favorable experience in the Amherst Health Insurance Trust Fund over the last couple of years. Um, there are other comparisons on pages 40 and 41. And 40 has a nice breakdown of the various sections of the charts, what is considered under each category. So I, and that's worth looking at. On page 42 of the Finance Committee report is a staffing summary, and you'll notice there is a 2.2 increase in staffing. Next one, please. Oh, that's. either that's from my next report oh. <laughs> okay that's okay just I'll, I'll just read it and um, mrs. Streeter is always good about asking me for my handouts so they'll be on the town uh, um, town meeting website well anyway in uh, of the uh, 1,210 students in the elementary schools this year um, and an average of as as the superintendent said 38 
percent receive free and reduced lunch, and 14 percent are English language learners. And the uh, handout that you'll get on the website breaks it down by grade, and uh, special ed, English language learners, and uh, the free and reduced lunch. If town meeting approves of the finance committee recommended budget, the Amherst School Committee will review and discuss the budget and adjust the appropriate line items as needed. They also go through the budget year, every, all year long. So right now, town meeting has the responsibility to approve or disapprove of the budget. And we're going to urge you to approve of this budget after Mr. Pooler's enlightening explanation of the difference. Thank you, I now recognize Mr. Pooler. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I will call up my um, Amherst community budget players, uh, Catherine Oppie and Kay Moran, <laughs> pl playing the role of finance committee and town meeting generally is Kay Moran. Playing the role of schools is Catherine Oppie. Playing the role of just the finance guy is me. So. Uh, one of the things that the town has been doing for years is in having the schools reimburse us for what the state charges us for uh, charter school assessments and choice assessments. And um, it, it's a substantial amount of money. Bill, if you could do that next slide up there. Um, and so what used to happen is the town would appropriate money and give it to the school department. The schools would keep the nice shiny part which is for teachers and books and all the other things that they do. And they would then give about 900,000 of it to me to then give to the state. That's the old system. The state said they didn't like that anymore. So now what's going to happen is town meeting is going to give the school department a nice shiny button budget and they're going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> This is called cutting out the middle woman. <laughs> then town meeting is essentially going to give me the, but the assessment money, which I will give to the state, and the state will be happy, and the schools will be happy, and I hope you are all happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> this was the exception to the no applause rule. <laughs> that, was, that was a stunning performance. <laughs> <laughs> I now call on Ms. Appy to speak for the school committee. <laughs> Mr. Moderator, I'd like to request an extra minute for a total of four minutes. Without objection, you may proceed. The Amherst School Committee voted unanimously for this F The go. Amherst School Committee voted unanimously for this FY15 budget. Like last year, the goal of the school committee was to create a budget that was consistent with the district improvement plan and serve to support enriching programs for students while at the same time providing professional development for teachers and critical support for struggling learners. The district is committed to programs that are evidence-based examples of this enrichment professional development and support. The FY15 budget is focused on raising the level of achievement for all students and provide a continuum of supports and interventions. This process is a multi-year and multi-pronged approach. The foundations for implementing programs that are sustainable and evidence-based take careful planning both financially and professionally. Over the last three years, with, with sustainability in mind, the district has built budgets that take into account decreasing state aid and an economy that is not supporting public education in a way that it has historically. Working toward our goal, we have negotiated long-term contracts with staff and teachers, looked carefully at staffing needs in our buildings, and acted on decreasing student population. We have also paid close attention to the changing demographics of our students and their needs. This year, for the first time in recent memory, the Amherst Public Schools 
came in under budget while still adding all the programs and staff that are necessary to reach our educational goals of support and enrichment while still being able to return some monies to the town's general budget. This FY15 budget commits resources to create and implement a sustainable arts integration model in our elementary schools. This coming year, our arts teachers and specialists will be working with classroom teachers to integrate the arts into our everyday curriculum. This integration allows Amherst to continue to enrich our students' experience in a variety of ways and recognizes our community commitment to comprehensive programming. In the area of English language arts, we are working to strengthen our early literacy program so that we can reach our goal of all students reading by the second grade. This coming year, we will continue our efforts on strengthening instruction in part by focusing on how time is spent during the school day to include intervention, instructional time per content area, and adult professional development. Resources need to be directed toward mandated and district professional learning. This will allow staff and teachers professional growth in areas directly linked to district goals of an equitable and positive learning environment for all students. Another very significant focus is school climate. There has been much discussion about climate at the secondary level, but it starts here in elementary school. This coming year is a major building block toward our overarching goal of providing every single student in our district with the education, supports, and school environment they need and deserve in order to succeed. Thank you. Mr. Wald for the select board. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. On March 31st, the select board voted four to zero with one absent to recommend this amount. Thank you. Um, could we get the motion back up on the screen? And we are now gonna be open to discussion on the motion that will be before you any second, and this requires a majority vote. Is there discussion? Um, yes, right here in the center. Chris Riddle, uh, Precinct 2, um, I see uh, the graph of enrollment that drops over the course of the last 10 years. It uh, seems like um, every year we ask this question, we never really get to see this. I'd love to see the same graph of ex uh, salary expenditure or total expenditure per student over that period of time. Anybody? Um, yes, Ms. Townley. cost is calculated at the end of the uh, of the school year and it's done by the State Department I believe I do have the FY uh, last year's in there uh, the per pupil cost under under my um, write-up of the schools and I, if I can find it does anyone see it <laughs> page 37 it sounds uh, like it's yes Talk in the microphone, please. Uh, okay, for FY13, it was $19,062. So we, we don't have this year's yet. Thank you. Is that it, what you wanted? I'm, yeah. Oh. Um, hang on. Um, would you like to follow up? Yes, Mr. Riddle. Bear with me a second, please, I'm sorry. On page 43, there is a, a, a graph going, there's a graph going back to 2002, which describes the enrollment. Okay. It would be lovely to see the price per, the expenditure per pupil uh, graph, that same graph over that period of time. It would seemingly, since the budget is staying fairly flat, uh, be zooming up. It would seem like for us we are spending a lot more per student than we were, say, for instance, in 2002. I, I can understand the good reasons for that, but it seems like 
every year I ask this question, or somebody does, and the, uh, it seems like the school board uh, is trying to avoid, well, I don't want to impugn any uh, motives here. I just think it would be a very handy piece of information uh, to um, see the graph of the per, pu per pupil expenditure graph over time. Thank you. Ms. Tomlin? The, the school department has, very co the, has been very cooperative, and I did not ask for a graph for that, but uh, perhaps by June 2nd, we can get something for you. Is there further discussion? Yes, way over there. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Jim Bursat, Precinct 6, and a member of LSSE, um, but I'm, I'm speaking just uh, for myself. Um, back in January of this year, there was an article in the bulletin about how 89 children were not able to participate in the after-school program, and uh, it was stated that uh, there was gonna be some private fundraising. So I, I'd like an update on how many of those children have been able to participate, um, what the private fundraising has um, earned, and more importantly, um, the budget here includes $20,000 to pay for a subsidy for, for those children, but my understanding from the bulletin, that was a cost of 2,400 per child, so this subsidy only will take care of 10 of those 89. Um, so I, I think if we, we have a growing number of free and reduced lunch children, a um, dollar spent on programs, after school programs, over the life of a child in our school saves at least nine to 10 or even more dollars in terms of fewer discipline problems better uh, graduation rates, all sorts of things. So I, I really feel it is incumbent on the school committee next year to make sure that no child is denied participating in that program because their family does not have enough money. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, you um, if you have something to say, you can speak to it, but you're not required to. Yeah, I'll just make a, a brief statement. I thoroughly agree. Um, in our after school this year, the town did provide a substantial, I think, $40,000 for waivers and vouchers for students. The school, since that time when the article um, was published, we have um, on the school end provided an additional $30,000 worth of funds this year. And, and much of those funds are also to support students who have special education needs and who need additional support to participate fully in the after school program. We have appropriated with the support of the school committee an additional $20,000 for next school year. Um, again, that is the kind of the tip of the iceberg and additional funding would be um, helpful. Uh, but at this point, um, multiple sources have been providing additional revenue. So thank you. And yes, over there. Walter Walnick, Precinct 5. Uh, on the budget office page of the school's website, Robert Detweiler's name disappeared just days ago as director of finance, uh, uh, leaving only an assistant director of finance title and name appearing there. In previous annual town meetings, Mr. Detweiler was available in the auditorium to answer budget questions. A widely followed local news outlet reported some time ago Mr. Detweiler's mysterious failure to appear at a budget coordinating group meeting, but school officials declined to answer the news outlet's questions about why he was suddenly absent and later questions about his continued absence, other than saying he was on paid leave and later on unpaid leave. Mr. Detweiler impressed me as a man of integrity. 
a real straight arrow based on my observations of him at prior year budget coordinating group and finance committee meetings I attended. Why is he on leave? When will he return to work? Can town meeting, along with the finance committee and budget coordinating group, look forward to benefiting from his participation in the budget process in calendar 2015? Ms. Gare? Thank you. Um, we do have at this moment Mr. Detweiler. Um, please, is close, real oh, close to the mic. Is on administrative leave. Um, you're ac absolutely correct. We will not comment on why he is on leave because we have contracts with our staff and there is a certain level of confidentiality that's required in these circumstances. We do not expect Mr. Detweiler to return to his role and that's why the name is no longer on the website. Mr. Mangano has, is the assistant director and he has been in place uh, for a number of years now and he has been assuming the bulk of the responsibility with Paul Carlson who has been our previous finance director for a number of years providing um, part-time support to Mr. Mangano. So um, I appreciate your support of Mr. Detweiler. However, I won't be speaking further about the reasons why he is no longer in this role. Thank you. Um, back, third one in from the end. Yes, you. Catherine Gilbert Espada, Precinct 6. Um, we were given the uh, percentage of students of color in the elementary schools. Could I have the percentage of teachers of color in the elementary schools? Ms. Gare? Yes. Um, it is about 17%, but I do have the report if maybe Ms. Mazur wants to take a quick look at the report and I can tell you exactly. However, our staff of color clearly in all roles do not represent the student population we have in our schools. And that does continue to be a huge priority of our HR department, not only looking for staff to um, apply for positions and interview positions from outside of our community, but also to um, encourage and grow our staff within. So we have um, an initiative with Rachel Bowen, who's working with our five colleges right now, to um, work with our paraeducators to support them in licensure programs, because many of our staff have bachelor's degrees and many master, uh, master's degrees, <laughs> but the licensure pro uh, process is um, sometimes very expensive and there's lots of hoops to jump through. So Rachel and um, the five colleges are working together to grow our own in terms of paraeducators. Also in terms of our teachers, we have this year for the first time worked on a licensure program are supporting our, our uh, staff to become administrators internally because clearly the pipeline is very, very narrow for staff of color locally and uh, across the country. So we're trying to take uh, multiple strategies. But I will have Ms. Mazur, do you want to look and see if we can find the exact? Um, do you want Oh, do you want to like be recognized? To may I recognize Ms. Mazur? Uh, no, but I can. You can, thank uh, you. <laughs> yes. I don't know um, the lingo. Yes, you may be recognized. You should identify yourself first. Hi, I'm uh, Kathy Mazur, HR Director for the Schools. I think one thing I'd like to add in addition to what Superintendent Garrick mentioned was um, this past year we uh, included um, an initiative in all of our hiring in which we uh, strongly invited multilingual um, staff as a result uh, to, to join us. As a result of that hiring effort, 33% of our new, s our new staff were Spanish speaking. Thank you. Uh, to be, well, I'm sorry, to be exact, um, thank you, um, Superintendent Garrick. In Amherst, there's 18.6% staff of color, uh, and in the region, there's 17.5 staff of color. Percent, I'm sorry, percentages, not, actual, not FTE. Thank you. Um, yes, right here in the center. You, yeah. Um, just to follow up to um, the Identify last. yourself, please. Um, Vera Duangmini, Precinct 7. Um, a follow-up question, and then I have another separate question um, about the budget. Um, so if anything you can fit into three minutes, okay. you can do. So the, the follow-up question is, um, could we get some, some separation of um, 
teachers of color who teach core classes um, versus you know the overall staffing of color. And why don't you ask your other question now, Tim? And then the other question I had was, I'm trying to find out how much we pay for counsel um, attorneys, basically the bill we pay for legal counsel. Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Yes. Um, yes. On and the website, the you line. Identify yourself. Oh, hi, my name is Sean Mangano, Assistant Director of Finance. Um, on the website, under the biz, uh, budget information, you can look at the line by line budgets, and there's lines for legal expenses um, one under uh, special education, one under human resources, and one under school committee. And there's also Ms. Garrett, if you want to answer the other question. Um, I would be also happy to um, gather that information for you and distribute it to the next town meeting if that would be helpful in both both areas. You're welcome. Thanks. Further discussion? Um, yes, right there. Uh, Pat Holland, Precinct 1. Um, I have a grandson who will be going into the Amherst schools of, in kindergarten this coming fall. And I've been wondering about how the schools teach about two things, bullying for one, and illegal drug use for the other. Um, I, will, I will allow you to answer, but I'd, I'd ask you to keep it brief because I think there's other forums where that's gone into it in a lot more detail and it's not directly related to the budget, but you can still answer. Norris. I'm Mike Morris. I'm an educational director, and on the bullying, we do have a, um, res a research-based bullying program, program um, at all levels. Um, second step would be at the kindergarten level, and we um, step to step to respect as students get older. Uh, we take that very seriously. We want to make sure the school environment is very healthy for all students. Um, in terms of the second question on drugs, as students get towards upper elementary, we do have health units that are focused on that very issue. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yes, right there. Thank you. Adrian Terizzi from Precinct 7. I'd like to ask a question regarding uh, the budget for regular education uh, compared to special education with a focus on special education. Um, can you tell me the percentage increase in special education from FY14 to 15? That's the first part. Quickly, a second part. Do you have a specific budget that we could have for the out-of-district placements? And third and last, how do our numbers in special education, both by racial composition and uh, budget compared to our state uh, numbers and percentages. Thank you. Ms. Garrett? We can get you the out-of-district tuition numbers. Again, that's uh, in the line-by-line line on the website, but we can get that for you for next time. And I don't have the exact percentage. I can add up the dollar increases, but we can get you the exact percentage for next time. And yes, Ms. Garrett. We currently have three students at the elementary level projected to be in out-of-district placements next year because we have, oh, I'm sorry about that. We do have um, three students we anticipate, I think, this year being in out-of-district placement, and I think it's going down lower than that, possibly to one, you know, give and take, because we never know what where students will be in, in their world and their needs uh, for next year, uh, which is a, a, an extremely low number for a public school of our size. And I think it's a direct result of our um, creating in-district placements and having a range of services to support our students. But we can give you the exact dollar amount. Further discussion? Yes, back in the corner there. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, it, it might be news to the town meeting in general, but I, I, hopefully it's not to the school committee in particular that um, the school committee hires three individuals, the superintendent, the director of special education, and the uh, business manager. And so I wonder if there's a school committee member who can tell us 
um, given your role in the hiring, when that's going to take place and how that will affect the budget um, that you've proposed to us. Um, the, the second question is, um, in, in terms of money being spent to assist teachers to do a better job, um, what of the funding that you do provide um, is focused on helping teachers accomplish goals without um, uh, acting with, um, try not to act with uniformity. In other words, hopefully your, your programs in the elementary school allow teachers to use their own skills to approach each child. They know what the end results that the, the elementary schools would like to achieve, but given that they're individuals and that their students are individuals, um, it, uh, it doesn't lend itself to um, the overall result may be the same that you want to achieve, but it might not be that in every classroom the same approach is being used uh, to, um, to reach that end. And to what extent are you assisting teachers while you uh, try to accomplish um, certain ends? What, how are you trying to assist teachers to do that um, and remain individuals and approach the individuals in their classes? And, um, and, and what monies are you spending in that particular way? Because I, I think that's critical. Uniformity of approach is, will not you want uniformity of results without having uniformity of approach, and, and how are you spending money to accomplish that? Um, hang on, I hear a point of order. Um, wait for a microphone, please. Joan Tenson, Precinct 8. I don't believe that previous speaker's uh, question is directly related to the budget, and I... So I'm asking whether that is related to the budget. Um, it was phrased in terms of which portions of the budget are being used to support certain approaches. So it was tangentially related. So I'm saying it's OK. <coughs> and do we have somebody in the school committee or staff? Yes, Ms. Appen. Um, in answer to your first um, question. Real close to the microphone. In answer to your first question, um, the school committee approved the plan of having Mr. Magano um, uh, lead the finance office at this time with the support of Paul Carlson, um, a, a someone who has been in the who had been in the district for a long time and is very very experienced. Um, we have not been presented with another candidate at this time. And anybody from Ms. Garrick? I'm sorry, Mr. Morris. So I appreciate that question um, about the individuality of teachers because that's certainly the approach we take. Nice and close to the microphone. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and, and just a couple examples. I can't give you an exact dollar amount right now because it's so embedded in the fabric of what we do in Amherst, in our district, that it, it'd be hard to separate out all those things. So just a couple examples uh, briefly. Um, I think when you talk about the common ends, that's really describing a standards movement, and that's happened in Massachusetts, that we want to have outcomes for kids that are clear and multiple ways to get there. Um, so just two examples I'll mention briefly. Um, Dr. Brady and I, Dr. Brady sitting in the, in the front row, uh, led last year a co-teaching workshop. So this is multiple teachers working together in an inclusive environment, as Dr. As Ms. Garrick, Superintendent Garrick, excuse me, s said earlier. That's really capitalizing on the individual strengths of both, both teachers be able to work together. So there was a cost to that one, so I wanted to make sure I, I responded to it. The other is in our most recent contract, we've established clear language where teachers can lead professional development exercises um, and study groups with each other and be the facilitators of those because we're so lucky to have such talented teachers in Amherst. And that really is also capitalizing not on a hierarchical approach, but in an approach that we trust our teachers and they have so much to offer to each other and we now have a very clear system. Uh, and there is a financial aspect to that as well. Um, so I can't give you a, a concrete number, but I can tell you that everything that we do is focused on supporting our teachers in that way and recognizing the individuality that helps them build relationships with students. Thank you. 
there's further discussion before we come to a vote. Um, yes, Ms. Conley. I'd, I'd like the superintendent to tell me if I'm correct, but I do believe as the uh, Education Act in 1993, the uh, responsibility of hiring all staff is the superintendent. The only responsibility of the school committee is the hiring of the superintendent and developing policy. Is that correct? Um, um, hang on a second. Um, we want to respond, uh, Ms. Garrick first and then Mr. Shabazz. The school committee. I'm close. Oh, Every I apologize. You'll have, Mike has to be right up next to your mouth. I know. You'll have to keep yelling at me. I'll try really hard. Um, the school committee, um, the superintendent brings a candidate for a finance director to the school committee for their vote, for their approval, as well as a special education director. Um, that is my understanding of um, the role of the school committee in the hiring process, even with the school reform. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Shabazz? Yes, Mass General Law, um, <coughs> Part 1, Title 12, Chapter 71, Section 37, uh, E and F, also gives the school committee authority over the hiring of legal counsel for both general purposes as well as special education purposes. We have authority over legal counsel as well. Thank you. Further discussion? Um, yes, over there, right in the middle. Hi, Olivia Price, Basin 5. Um, um, I just had a question about one of the... Um, real mic right up oh, next sorry. to your lips. There you go. Um, I had a question about one of the, um, one of the lines on the, on the personnel. What exactly is intervention? I know that uh, people kept mentioning it, and it's just not immediately obvious to me what intervention is. Yes, Mr. Norris. So I think it in general describes um, what, what kind of gets into jargon, but a tiered approach so that when we have students who are struggling, um, we want to reduce uh, our reliance on special education when possible because we don't want to identify students who don't have special needs. So if you think about general education, intervention is for students who need support to get up to the level that we want them to get up to. And that, that's true both in the academic realm and we also provide intervention in the social emotional realm for our students. So it's a regular education support um, to support students um, who need it. Further discussion? Um, yes, right here in the center. Gordon Freed, Precinct 6, said, no one said I talk too softly, I don't think. So you very nicely on page 41 provided us uh, the budget from 2006 and then projected for 2015. And if you divide those numbers, you get $13,000 plus uh, per student in 2006 and 19000 plus for 2015. That's a 46% increase, approximately. Um, but I also noticed that we have about a 20% decrease in the number of students. Does that mean we are going to be closing schools, or does that mean we have fewer students per teacher in a classroom? Ms. Garrick? So um, at this moment, what we are recognizing is that um, we are not having s fewer students in classrooms, but as our enrollments decline, the corresponding staff, which is uh, typically at the elementary level, specifically our classroom teachers are declining. What is not declining um, are the specific populations that need additional support in our schools. So we're seeing ELL, special education, intervention staff increasing, where classroom teachers are decreasing. Over a 10-year period of time, our class size has remained um, stable, as has the staff-to-student ratio overall, if that's helpful. Ready to come to a vote. Um, yes, I see a hand here. Call a question. Um, hang on just a sec. Put your hand, is there, I'm going to recognize him to call a question if I see anybody else who wanted to speak, if that makes sense. But if anyone else wanted to speak, maybe we'll skip that step. So. Did anyone else want to speak? Yes, in that case, Mr. Jackson, sorry. 
you recognize now. Okay, motion is made for the previous question. I'm sorry, did, do you understand what I just did there? Okay, I only saw one hand. That was Mr. Jackson, and he m moved for the previous question, which would have been silly, right, if there was no one else who wanted to speak anymore. So I just did another check, but yes, there was someone who wanted to speak, in which case I accepted his motion, because since he was the one I had recognized. Hope that makes sense now. At any rate, right now we're gonna come to an immediate vote on the motion for the previous question. If two-thirds of you vote yes, then we are done with the debate and we will then come to a, a vote on the elementary school budget. Motion of the previous question requires two-thirds. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. Moderator here is two-thirds. We will now come to a vote on the elementary school budget. And the motion is before you on the screen, moving that the town raise and appropriate $21,490,563 for the Amherst Elementary School. The majority vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. We now move on to the regional school portion of Article 12, and I call on Ms. Pileman to make a motion. I move that the town approve the Amherst uh, Pelham Regional School District operating budget of $29,618,478 and that the town raise and appropriate $14,463,908 as its share of the budget. Um, Do I hear a second? second? I hear a second. You may speak to your motion. How many? Three. Um, you would like an additional three minutes without objection. It is granted. The Finance Committee voted to support uh, and recommend the regional school budget with a vote of five to zero with one abstention because of a potential conflict of interest. The regional budget begins on page 44 of your booklet. Um, the regional school district is a separate entity made up of the grades seven through 12 and it has its own budget. On page 45, you will see that it directly receives Chapter 70 money, transportation monies, and other funds. And you'll also see uh, what they call excess and deficiency, or E&D, which is similar to the town's reserves. In the middle of the page on the left side are the figures uh, for total revenue, total expense. And if you go down toward um, two-thirds of the page, you'll see the FY15 column the amount of money we're, uh, that they will spend this year, and that's up 1.7%. At the bottom of the page are the assessments to the four regional towns, and those four towns are Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury. Uh, our assessment as a town is $14,463,908, or up $305,078, or an increase of 2.15%. Uh, uh, on page 46 are the payroll and expense accounts, and on page 47 you'll see what they added and reduced from the budget. Uh, this budget is 24% of the town's operating budget, and that's the same percentage as last year. So, can we have the, the two charts, please? Not that one, but the two. Um, No, that's too far ahead. <laughs> uh, this one is the, uh, re the regional assessments. There's a pie chart and a number chart. It probably is the one before.
you know what? Anything that looks like it might uh, be a regional you, you assessment. You know what? Um, Do you have something you can put on the I overhead? I have some paper here. We can Great. Let's just use the overhead. Can we just switch to the overhead? She has a document. Unless this is it, regional school assessment? Oh, there it is. Oh, that was it. <laughs> oh, here we go. Could you move it up a little bit? Yeah. Raise that a little higher. Okay. 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 All right. Um, the assessments are listed, um, and you'll see that Amherst pays the largest amount of the assessment, 77.2%. Uh, Pelham pays 6.7%, Leverett 77 and Shootsbury 84 um, When we get down to uh, assessments, um, they are 63.3% of the total regional budget. 36.7% is made up of other revenues. See all that? Okay. Now we'll do the pie chart. And there it is in a pie. Okay. All right. <clears throat> That's fine. Uh, Mr. Bahanowitz has uh, implemented a formal process for developing a capital budget for upcoming years and a multi year capital plan, which sets uh, timelines for future implementation and budget considerations, uh, which is important in maintaining our buildings. Any school-related capital request, again, appears in the Capital Planning uh, Committee Report, Joint Capital Ca Planning Committee Report. Okay. Uh, the uh, school department continues to meet with the four towns prior to the budget process, and they uh, meet with the school committees, the finance committees, and the select boards. As part of the... Um, Okay, the next part is uh, the parts of the budget. Oh, there we go. The percent of the budget for regular, regular education has gone down um, over the last nine years from 33.23% to 28.23% this year, and it's going to go up slightly next year by 0.5%. Special education has gone up. Uh, from FY06, and it will go up slightly next year. Administrative services will go down next year for two reasons. One, the central <coughs> office <coughs> excuse me, uh, staff assignments have changed, and uh, they've been reallocated. So that has gone down uh, for region and has gone up for Amherst. The Health uh, Insurance Trust Fund is reimbursing the treasurer and benefits specialist who handle the insurance. So, so that's, those are the two reasons. Although employee and retiree health insurance has gone up since FY06 by 3.53%, next year it's going to go down by 0.6%. And it's important to recognize how well our Amherst Health Insurance Trust Fund works. It certainly has kept the rate of increase, it slowed it down considerably. So um, I think that's excellent. For more comparisons, uh, look on page uh, 48. And again, it, it breaks out the various sections of the chart. And on 49, it gives you additional comparisons. Again, you see uh, a staffing summary and that shows an 8.67 percent reduction in staffing for the region and on page 51 is student enrollment the projected enrollment for next year is 1457 students <coughs> down from uh, uh, 06 by 467 students for a 24.3 percent decline the 100 choice in students that you see on that page are included in the enrollment figures. There are 274 students in off-campus placements, and charter and choice out schools are part of the reason for
for the decline. We've had private schools you know, far in the past as well as vocational schools. So the recent uh, addition has been charter and choice out. Okay, now we're gonna go. We're gonna do it here. Okay, <clears throat> of the uh, 1,498 students in the secondary schools this year, an average of 27% receive free or reduced lunch and 4% are English language learners. 91.3% of the 1,555 students in the class of 2013 graduated, and we continue to be higher than the state average. Uh, the budget process for the regional schools is ongoing as it is for Amherst, um, and so they always live within the um, approved budget figure, but they do occasionally change line items. Earlier town meeting voted the alternative assessment method and now we need to approve of the bottom line of the budget. Uh, the budget must be approved by three of the four towns in the region. Uh, and on Saturday, the other three towns did approve the regional budget and their assessment. So we're locked into this budget um, because the three towns approved before we did. But we still would urge you to approve of the regional budget and Amherst assessment. Thank you. Ms. Appy for the school committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I'd like to request two additional minutes. Two additional minutes for a total of five. Without objections, you may continue. Thank you. The Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee voted unanimously to support this FY15 budget for the regional schools. As in years past, this year the regional district must make some cuts in order to come in with a balanced budget. With careful planning, however, we were able to add important line items and keep any cuts as far away from the classroom as possible. This is due in large part to a careful multi-year plan. As with the elementary budget, the region is committed to sustainable, comprehensive programming. The district understands that 21st century education must meet the needs and goals of ever-changing challenges and skill development for our students. The skill set to succeed is very different than it was even 10 years ago. Students do best when their learning is supported by best instructional practice, access to 21st century curriculum, and when teachers have a clear understanding of their learning needs, which then allows for appropriate additional challenge and support. <coughs> we are fortunate in our school district to have a diversity of learners who are interested in and excel in a variety of ways. Our schools have talented mathematicians, writers, actors, sculptors, and computer whizzes. Students whose love of language can be fostered with a coherent and cohesive language program. We have strong student leaders who interact with adults and fellow students to help lead efforts around school climate and equity. The FY15 regional school bud budget is adding resources to continue professional and curricular development. This has to be the cornerstone of our system. Every student must have teachers who have access to professional development in order to continue as lifelong learners and offer the best instructional practice. Educational equity must begin with this best practice coupled with access for everyone to the highest level curriculum. There are many supports that <coughs> students need in order to succeed <coughs> academically. These can include things that are not directly related to academics. In the coming school year, the high school is adding one such support. The BRIGHT program, or Bridge for Resilient Youth in Transition, is modeled after a program developed at Brookline High School. Last year, Amherst Regional High School had an increase of students with mental health related issues. Over 50 students were screened for self-harm concerns and there were a substantial number of initial referrals to special education due to emotional difficulties. Bright is a school-based program that supports students experiencing acute emotional crisis and can support them through this difficult time 
without inadvertently creating more stress and anxiety due to academic pressures and worries. Bright will enable our school system to better serve this population of students and their families. Another group of students effectively served by this Bright program are students who have suffered concussions or other long-term illnesses and are experiencing some level of distress that interfere with sustaining attendance in full days of school. This program enables students to stay in school and continue their education without disruption. At the middle school, a significant addition to the budget are resources for a math instructor to lead an after-school portfolio class to meet the needs of high-achieving math students. Math Navigator is another addition, which is to ensure that struggling students have an effective and proven intervention. Finally, the Regional School Committee has taken on the investigation of regionalizing our elementary schools to form a pre-K-12 region. As you may know, the original board has been appointed and will bring their recommendations to the school committee. You will be hearing more about this exploration in the next few months. Regionalization could lead to the most comprehensive and cohesive curricular alignment and allow our district leadership to focus more fully on the educational needs of our students and less on issues away from the classroom around operations and the running of multiple districts. I urge town meeting to support this long view budget that keeps our students and their diverse learning needs and styles in the fore. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wall for the select board. Mr. Wall for the select board. Thank oh, you. There you are. On March 31st, the select board voted four to zero with one absent to recommend this budget. Thank you. You have the motion before you. This requires a majority vote. And is there discussion? Um, the motion was seconded quite a while ago. Um, yes, yellow shirt right there. Tim Neal, Precinct 4, just a clarification. Are we voting on the operating alone or the operating in the capital budget, which is listed on the chart, on the screen? I think we're just not, I think we're just voting on the operating, but not we're, the We're voting budget. to raise and appropriate the 14 million figure. I understand, but it says operating in the capital budget. And my question was, is it just the operating budget versus the operating in capital budget? Um, I think I think it's a, and regardless of the answer, we're voting to appropriate the 14 million share, but can anybody, just the operating budget, just the operating budget, so. I don't, um, could you, now I'm, no, hang on for the point of our, now I'm confused. So is the $29 million figure just the operating budget as well? Okay, so the capital budget word in there should just ignore that. In either case, we're looking at the 14 million. Is there still a point of order or is that cleared up now? Um, hang on a second. Do you have a point of order? There's the microphone. Terizzi, Precinct 7. If indeed this is the operating budget, then may I suggest we remove capital? From the, uh, Motion um, itself. You know, I'm going to allow it to be removed without any further question or debate since it didn't mean to be there and it won't affect the outcome of anything. So it shouldn't have been in the motion. Just get rid of that and also. There we go. Um, yes, Ms. Moran. The finance guys are over there conferring, but I believe that the capital budget, it's, it's not quite like a capital budget for the town that you see. Um, the, the capital budget, this would be the operating and capital budget. If they buy a lawnmower or if they buy a, um, change the door knobs on the entire school and they don't have to borrow money for it, that's in this budget that we're voting now. <coughs> it's only if they have to borrow money for a large project that it is, a, I believe it would be a separate article 
for a, a capital appropriation. Mm -hmm. When they do borrow money, Mr. Poor. Yeah. <laughs> when they do borrow money uh, for, exa for example, um, changing out the windows at the middle school or repairing the high school roof, it comes as an assessment to us, and then that shows up in the JCPC budget. But within this budget, if they have small capital items, they are allowed. It's part of what they can spend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my understanding then is technically it would be correct to say operating and capital budget within that context. Would you agree with that, Mr. Poor? I would agree with that. Okay. Why don't you put it back in? What the heck? <laughs> okay, um, we're open to discussion now. And yes, right there in the white shirt, or late blue, whatever it is. Yes, you. John Fox, Precinct 10. Um, if you could look at page 44. A uh, little over halfway down, it says the estimated net other post-employment benefits, the OPEB obligation, is presented in the budget although funding is not included in this year's budget or in any previous budgets, and that you're working on it. So I wonder if uh, you could explain how much is owed, what's the present value of that? We had to see that for the town. Uh, so does anybody know how much we owe, the present value of what we owe, and why we're not addressing uh, this as a serious matter? Uh, so that's my question. Anybody on the finance committee want to address that? And, um, Ms. Ms. Garrick. So the pr I'll speak a little bit for the school committee and you can correct me. The school committee has, conver has had conversations around their obligation and at this point they are in the process of um, looking at a policy for investments which is required before they put funds into this account. Um, Sean, and so that is on the docket for their policy work. Uh, once that is um, complete, then I think they need to have a conversation of how they would choose to, to begin to fund um, this obligation. So that will be a commu uh, school committee conversation shortly. I think Mr. Mangano can address the amount, if that moderator I'm sure, would, Mr. Mangano. And just following up on Maria, um, to set up a true OPEP trust fund, we need to have an investment policy in place, and that's been discussed at the policy, policy subcommittee recently. And uh, so we had a valuation done last year, and it estimated our net OPEP obligation at $21,521,792. Further discussion? Um, yes, back there, back row. Um, <clears throat> Pat Church, Precinct 5, I'm, I'm afraid I have a question about a um, page 50, the staffing profile. Um, I understand the, the specific analysis by full-time equivalents, I, and if you look on the far right-hand side, it gives you plus 1, plus 0.10, yada, yada. Building specific personnel, that's the teaching staff and the paraprofessionals, virtually no change. And then the next one down, which is district program and support personnel, you, there's almost a person change, increase. Um, and yet the section I really don't understand is net budgeted additions and reductions. It says that magically our staff went from 310 full-time equivalents to 302, but I can't see above there where those full-time equivalents have disappeared, um, unless you're, again, going back to 2006 and it's not explained. Yes, you may answer. So the, the change column should be pretty much zero um, because we present a level services budget in terms of the lines of the, the budget. So the, the only adjustments would be level service adjustments. Um, so, for example, the, the district program and support personnel changes you see, see, one is, actually they're both restored vacancies, um, positions that were empty in FY14 that we expect to be filled next year, but they're not actually budget additions. The net budget additions 
number, the 8.5, um, or 9.5, um, that we don't put up in the lines because they're not technically approved yet. So they're on the, they tie to the budget additions page. So you can see what those positions are, but they're not actually reflected in the lines above yet. They're put as one line item at the bottom, similar to how the line item budget is reflected. It's one number at the end of the budget. Um, no, I'm gonna recognize somebody else. Um, yes, way over there. Um, Janet, Janet McGowan, um, Precinct 8. My question is, do we even have to vote on this motion? Because I think Ms. Tileman said that the three other school towns have voted for this budget, so it doesn't matter if we vote for it or not. And could, could she explain that? Why is that? Somebody, Ms. Ms. Tileman? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. You, we would have to vote it, but if we voted it down, it's, it really wouldn't matter because the other three towns have voted it. But we, would, we do have to take a vote, one way or the other. The fact, just the fact that it's on the warrant means we have to deal with it at town meeting. Um, further discussion? Um, yes, Mr. Gersh, I'm sorry. Who's that? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Rick, could just to answer the other person's question a little bit more. Yeah, it's just speak right into that microphone, really close. It's just that the 8.5 hasn't flowed up into the, the detail yet, so it's not giving you the detail of where the 8.5 comes from. It's just showing you the total at the bottom. Thank you. Um, way in the back there in the center. Siobhan Best, Precinct 9. Um, <clears throat> I'm just a little... As Speak okay. really close into the microphone. Um, I'm a little astounded. Uh, it was uh, mentioned earlier that there were 55 uh, students in the high school who were, um, and I don't want to uh, misquote, but something to the effect of uh, harming themselves and or others and with, I have a kindergartner and I have a seventh grader, and uh, so I have uh, several more years in the Amherst school system. Um, and, and so, and then we've had a rash of, um, in some ways, highly publicized and in many other ways, um, hush hushed um, episodes of so called racial, um, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, Carolyn Gardner, the high school uh, math teacher. So I'm just um, hoping that with this budget that goes through, uh, that maybe we could kind of understand where we're headed. And as, uh, in addition to focusing on math uh, and having remedial and extra math help on all levels, that we actually also make um, concerted efforts to um, kind of grow a community of support systems and really dialogue um, about these very important social, uh, inescapable um, dilemmas of our social environment. Thank you. And further discussion on the budget. Um, yes, third row, right there. This is really asking for um, clarification. Identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. Edith McMullen, Precinct 2. This is really asking for clarification. You indicated that really the important thing was the uh, appropriation of the 14 million plus plus. And yet the motion reads that we approve the larger amount and appropriate the 14 million. It seems to me we have to approve the budget. Am I? It, it's, that's what the motion says anyway. Okay, that's a fair statement. I'll accept that. I just want to be clear. Yeah. Um, further discussion? Um, yes, on the aisle right there. Jeff Blaustein, Precinct 6. I call the previous question. Motion has been made for the previous question. Um, we will come to an immediate vote. If two-thirds of you vote yes, we will then come to a vote on the motion before us. 
All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. Moderator hears two thirds. We will now come to a vote on the motion before us. Um, as it reads on the screen, and this is a re requires a majority. All those in favor of the motion for the regional schools, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. no. The ayes have it. We next move to Article 17, which was scheduled immediately after the school budget articles. Article 17, Capital Program Wildwood School Feasibility Study. And I call on Ms. Appy to make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town of Amherst appropriate the amount of $1 million for the purpose of paying cost of the Amherst Public School District Wildwood Elementary Feasibility Study. Wildwood Elementary School, located at 71 Strong Street, Amherst, Mass. Including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, and for which the town of Amherst may be eligible for a grant from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or MSBA, said amount to be expended under the direction of the Wildwood School Building Committee. To meet this appropriation, the Amherst Treasurer, with the approval of the Amherst Select Board, is authorized to borrow said amount under and pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44 um, or pursuant to any other enabling authority. The Town of Amherst acknowledges that the MSBA's grant program is a non-entitlement discretionary program based on need as determined by the MSBA and any costs of the Town of Amherst, any costs the Town of Amherst incurs in excess of any grant approved by and received from the MSBA shall be the sole responsibility of the Town of Amherst and that the amount of borrowing authorized pursuant to this vote shall be reduced by any grant amount set forth in the feasibility study agreement that may be executed between the Town of Amherst and the MSBA. Thank you. Do I hear a second? I hear a second. And I believe you don't wish to speak to the motion, but you want to? Yes. OK. Thank but you. instead, you want to um, ask Mr. Bahanowitz and Mr. Morris to share the additional the speaking to the motion. OK, Correct. so the two of you may come forward and let me know if you're requesting additional time beyond your five minutes. Um, and I just wanted to add okay. that the school committee unanimously recommended this motion. I'm also a member of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, and the Joint Capital Planning Committee also unanimously recommended this motion. Thank you. So the two of you have five minutes. Do you need additional time? Yes, Mr. Moderator, we'd like an initial five minutes, please. Um, I'm going to just check in with the body to make sure they um, um, have five minutes. They request an additional five minutes for Article 17. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. Additional time is granted. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes. Point of order. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Could the motion that was made, which is not what the article was, can that be displayed uh, unless they're going to make a presentation? I believe they're making a presentation. When they're done speaking to it, we'll put it back on the screen. Thank you. And I think you need the overhead, right? Yes, yeah. Sir. So when they're done, we'll put it back. You may begin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ron Bahanowitz, Director of Facilities of the Town and the Schools. And I'm Michael Morris, an Educational Director for the District. We've put together a quick presentation. I'll try to go through it as fast as possible. I apologize, but I want to cover as much material as we possibly can. And this is in regards to uh, the Wildwood Feasibility Study. Go to the next one, Bill. I put together a quick slide about what the old process was when you, when you did some type of renovation, build, addition, or some significant capital improvement to a school building, and then what it is today. And I'll walk us through it just real quickly. Previously, pre-2005, pre what would happen is a community such as ours would go forward and they'd say, oh, I want to build a new school. Maybe a group of people together would get together and say that. The town would pay for a study. The town would pay for architects and engineers. The town would pay for design. And then the town would go to the state. This is the key part here. 
the town would go to the state and say to the state, hey, uh, would you help us fund the school? In the meantime, the town had already put all this money out. The state would accept or deny your request. So you could have laid out a lot of money pre-2005 before you even got to this point, and then the state said, no, we're not gonna play in the game. Uh, the school would be built if they did play. The town would request payments from the school, about the school and so forth, and then discrepancies would be resolved. And the discrepancy would be that the, the town chose to put on a larger gymnasium, a pool, or something else that the state would not fund, and then there'd be a problem. We today are paying for debt and getting reimbursements from the state from 1997 renovation at the high school. Post-2006, there was a new organization created, which is the MSBA. The MSBA is the Massachusetts School Building Authority. The first thing they did is they tried to pay all their bills. That was the first thing they did. The second thing that they did is they created this process, which would, what would happen is a school district would ask them if they would participate with the school district in funding a school renovation, addition, any significant type of capital adventure. The, the, um, the state would then make some kind of commitment to the funding, which they've made to us already uh, by saying, we're willing to go into this with you on a feasibility study. And then they would, we would build our stuff out and then we'd go for our, our reimbursements. We did a window project on this school approximately a year and a half ago and it cost us $1.3 million and all of our money has been given back to us from the state at approximately, I say approximately 60%, it's 59.xxx percent, which was our current reimbursement rate at the time. So we're now looking at the new process. Uh, just some data for you to have, Wildwood School. What's Wildwood School like? Wildwood School is 14 acres. The assessed value is 250,000 approximately, 108,000 square feet with a $12 million building value for a total of $12.6 million is what we're assessed at currently at Wildwood School. The land was acquired in 1965 by Cowles, uh, from Cowles, I'm sorry. The school was built in 1970. The roof was replaced in 2003. Uh, no major renovations, no classroom changes, no additions, or no new windows, that type of stuff was uh, done to the school. Uh, the current age of the school is 44 years old. Next. A quick snapshot of the layout of the school. You see those, the big, uh, the, e, the C, D, E, F, G, and H. Those were large classrooms at one time that have been subdivided into the four classrooms uh, in each. We call those quads. Next slide. This is what a typical quad looks like. Uh, where you see the restrooms, that's a boys and a girls room, in blue and pink, I, I did. Um, <laughs> and you can see that what we did is we've created an X in the middle with just temporary partitions. So there's four different classrooms in this area with approximately up to 22 students in each classroom, never mind the staff, there could be anywhere from one to three staff in a, in a room at any given time and there are no noise barriers from room to room. Also what happens is a student in number one, room number one, a, a female student to go to the bathroom needs to go from room one through either room three and four or room two and four to get to the restroom. So there's a disruption of the kids going through. Next please. Uh, I tried to get some pictures and this picture is of the hallway, uh, our Main office in the building is approximately 150 feet away from the main door. So from a security point of view, we, we, it's too late by the time we see people. Next. Uh, again, this is, a, this is the office. Uh, this is going to the office as well. This is a classroom. You can see the arrow. And that's, that's the separation where there are no doors between classrooms. That's where the, where the green arrow is. Go ahead. And this is the same classroom, but this is the opposite side. So there's two openings in that same classroom that go to two different spaces. So at any given time, there's 22 kids on one side of the space and 22 kids on the other side of the space. Uh, just showing the bathrooms in the classroom. Next. Again, the boys' room in the classrooms. Next. Uh, this is a creative solution. This is what teachers do. Uh, the teachers and the staff are very creative and they use any type of apparatus, anything that they can to make separation. In these buildings, in both Fort River and Wildwood, Currently, we have, I'm going to say, approximately 50 or 60 
dormitory lockers that were donated to us from the University of Massachusetts that we use as partitions. They're little temporary wooden closets. Uh, this is the library. Hard, the pictures didn't come out as well as I wanted them to, but the library uh, ha is a big open space. The hallways run right along the libraries, and what they've done is they've stacked up bookcases along the hallways to cut down the hallway noise into the library. And this is the same thing uh, with the library using the shelves as dividers. The exercise room, which was converted into a music room, has great acoustics. Uh, teacher's lounge created into a, teacher, into a teaching space for a special needs student. Again, more conversions. Water fountains that are not ADA compliant and also that our kids can't, cannot reach. Again, more dividers. Uh, closets that are turned into to learning spaces. Bathrooms that you cannot fit, fit a wheelchair in. The old generator, you'll see this on our capital report over and over and over, this is the old generator. Next, uh, this is the boilers. Uh, this is key because Article 20, uh, Article 18 is going to talk a little bit about boilers. The, it, well back one, if you can. This is the old boilers. One, go next. These are what new boilers look like. And I want to go another one because I want to give Mike time to talk. Another one. Another. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to follow up on some of the photos and, and comments that Ron made. There's significant educational implications. So as you can see, those classrooms, the walls don't go up, and that creates noise. And we have kids, and we want them to be noisy. We want them to be learning in that format. Um, and that's not, that's not possible in this setting. It also has a different impact on some of our special populations, including special ed and ELL students who um, need a quiet, many need a quieter environment. And we've seen evidence in terms of assessment scores. Right now, Crocker Farms special education students have higher assessment scores and show more growth than at Fort River and Wildwood, and I believe that the, the infrastructure plays a significant role in that. Safety and security, as, as Ron mentioned, uh, having the front office that far away from the from the, the main office and the front entrance that distance, that's not in terms of best practices. That's not you'd, the way you build a school right now. You'd want a lot more um, sight lines to the front, front entrance. Small group instruction for all students. So we have an enhancement block at our elementary school, which means we try to meet all learners where they are, including students who need additional challenges and need additional supports. The space is not conducive to supporting all students' needs that way and differentiating and co-teaching. Um, access, as, as some of the pictures showed that Ron had, it's not meant for all, all people, either students or teachers or community members in terms of having easy access into and around the building. A and again, the, the bathrooms that I think the picture showed very clearly, uh, that's disruptive when kids have to leave. It takes time from the, for the kid to walk there. It also takes dis it's also disruptive for the classrooms that have steady streams of students going in. We're talking about five and six year olds, right? So going to the bathroom is a frequent occurrence and we wanna make sure that that doesn't disrupt instruction for our students. What do we get out of a feasibility study? Uh, on the back table, we have a pink sheet and a yellow sheet that we put back there. The yellow sheet actually kind of de describes in more detail what you get out of a feasibility study. But in this, in this case, we'll get an initial space summary. We'll, we'll document our existing conditions. We'll do some design parameters, develop and evaluate all kinds of alternatives. What we're going for here is not just a new or something. It can be a renovation. It can be an addition or it can be uh, new. It'll be whatever the state comes back to us, working with us, and we come up with a viable solution. It also may be a re, a redistrict, and not redistricting, but a re um, configuring of the classrooms, what they look like with two through six, K through one, and so forth. Um, and we'll end up with a schematic design, which is kind of the, the, what the, the school may look like, and we'll end up with a project cost in the end. Thank you. Um, I know. Can we have one more second? Sure, one more second. So, so I think the big thing for this body to know is that this isn't the end of the process, the vote tonight, that the feasibility would study happen, the feasibility study would happen if the vote is yes, and we'd come back to community meetings, school committee meetings, and, and eventually this body um, about the decision to build a school. So tonight isn't a route whether a decision about building a school, it's a decision about a feasibility study to better understand the process and what's possible and what's in the best interest of the town. Thank you. Um, I now call on, let's see, where were we? Um, Ms. Tileman for the Finance Committee. The, the, uh, finance, let's see, the Finance Committee.
committee recommends uh, this uh, wildwood feasibility study. Thank you. And what was the vote? Oh, I have to see that. Uh, it was unanimous, 6-0. Thank you. And you folks can just have a seat here in case there's questions. And Mr. Wald for the select board. Thank you. Jim Wald, select board, also joint capital planning committee. On April 7th, the select board voted unanimously to recommend this article. Uh, and as Mr. Bahana was explained to the JCPC, and he can correct me if I'm making a mistake, we had applied ourselves in the past several times for grants of this type and were not successful. And this time we were invited to apply. And we also had to name a priority school, pick one, and Wildwood seemed to be the most important one. And the number here is an estimate because it's, a long, it's an ongoing three-year process, but it's the best guess we have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. This will require a two-thirds vote to pass. And is there discussion? Um, yes, green shirt right there. Hi, Nelson Acosta, Precinct 8. Uh, I would agree with most of the assessment. My biggest concern is that, um, yes, why would needs repairs and upgrading, but my daughter attended um, Fort River School for two years, and I did notice a lot of the same things that you're talking about here. So the question is, why are we choosing, I have two questions. Why are we choosing Wildwood? Why aren't we putting both schools on the table, okay? Because we should be thinking about how can we also save money by, because we have, we're gonna spend a million dollars on this school. Are we gonna spend another million dollars on Fort River in a couple years down the road? Uh, and Fort River is in bad shape too, in my opinion. So I think it's, it's negligent of us to simply consider Wildwood and not consider Fort River School. The other thing is, I think we should also look, if we're looking, we have two old buildings, we should be looking at how maybe we can consolidate both of these buildings because um, I, I travel between Wildwood and Fort River School and I don't think there's a mile and a half difference between both locations. So I think at this point in time that where we're spending so much money that we should be thinking about outside the box and thinking about if we have two schools that are nearby, they're both very old, um, I think we're discriminating against the, the children in Fort River School if, or the parents if we don't put them on the table also. So I, 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 I could support a feasibility study that looks at both schools, but I think it would be discriminatory to only think about Wildwood and not look at Fort River. And that's my opinion, honest opinion. Thank you. Mr. North. So I, I taught at Fort River School for six years and I understand where you're coming from. And uh, we have to list three options for feasibility. In other words, you can't just say we want to rebuild. You have to, s you have to list three options. And one of the options that we did list is exactly one that you mentioned, Mr. Acosta, which is to look at um, with declining enrollment can we look at building one school and, and changing, I think we talked about reconfiguration. So that is on our minds. Um, and the reason we chose, the decision was made around Wildwood versus Fort Rivers. Fort River has had some, the one of the slides very early on that, that Mr. Bahanowitz talked about has had some renovations over the years, whereas Wildwood hasn't. But I don't disagree that some of the same issues exist in both schools, but that's why we are looking at that exact option that you mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Bahanowitz. And all I would like to add to that is that we have applied for both schools consecutively for the past, uh, since 2006, because uh, they are mirror images. And the state of Massachusetts requires us to pick one of, if we put in for multiple schools, we have to put in one as a priority school. And at that time, we chose Wildwood uh, back several years ago because of the condition of that. Thank you. Um, yes, right here in the front. Uh, Larry Kelly, Precinct 5, in the interest of transparency, I'm a father of two daughters who are in the school system. Uh, one, well, she's going into middle school, so I guess, oh God, so I guess that doesn't count. But the other one's in first grade, so there's a remote possibility that this will come to fruition before she graduates out of the sixth grade. Um, so I'm gonna support this, not because it's gonna benefit my first grader, but because it'll benefit all the kids. Um, obviously, I've lived in town all my life. I know these buildings fairly well, and I used to run a business, so I know what it's like to deal with capital items, and they are tired. They definitely need the work. Um, but with the, 
and, uh, and I supported th the library expansion, you know, or that study that may lead to a 10 or $12 million expansion. I supported last week the 700,000, or Monday, the 700,000 for the E Street School. Um, DPW is talking about a new building. I'll probably support that because I live 10 feet from them, so I know how tired that building is. Um, but I'm just here to tell you, I want to remind you of something that happened at the February 22nd JCPC meeting. Um, and the Amherst Fire Department had appeared with all of the items that we approved last week, and virtually 100% of them got through the process, but one was missing. And it's been happening for at least four years now in a row, and that's the $12 million for the South Amherst Fire Station, which we have been talking about since the 1950s. And that was on the table. It instantly got pushed off the table, and then they talked for 45 minutes about the pumper and the tr transmitters and the, the suits they wear and all that other good stuff, which we gave them last week. But at the end of that 45-minute discussion, before they left for the day, Mr. Pooler spoke up and he said, well, you know, I just want to remind people, the reason why I put this on here is because I don't want it to fall off your radar. So that's why it's appeared every year that he's been here. So none of you were at that meeting, so I just want to, and if I'm misquoting you, Sandy, jump in right now. I'm not. Um, so again, don't let that fall off your radar. So I'm going to support this. I'm going to support all of these things, but the fire station has to come first. And, and, and believe me, as someone who's been watching this closely for the last 30 years, I'm concerned about what, what Mr. Pooler said, that it has fallen off the radar. It really has become Amherst version of Flight 370. It has fallen off the radar without a trace. Okay, more discussion. Um, yes, um, one through right there, yes. Yes, two. No, 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 two rows back, one in. Right there, yes. Uh, Mary Wentworth, uh, Precinct uh, 5. I would like to draw the attention of town meeting members to the process by which the town decides about what to do with um, various buildings. Um, at the first session of this spring uh, town meeting, uh, we heard from the library about the money that they needed to do for a feasibility study and that the gateway organization to the state money is the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Now tonight we're hearing more about um, getting the feasibility money up on the table uh, and working with another gateway organization, uh, the um, Massachusetts School Building Authority. Uh, and I think that we have to think um, about whether our money is being well spent. Um, we're also hearing the same thing uh, from this authority, as we heard from the commissioners, that uh, uh, you got to think about um, building a new building. Um, and when you think about this process going on throughout the state, the question arises as to um, whether there are uh, strong forces operating behind uh, these two programs. Uh, we know that the construction industry is a very strong uh, lobbying uh, organization. Um, who, d who decides how much money is needed for a feasibility study? Uh, there isn't any um, entity, any business in Amherst that could take a look at Wildwood School. Um, I remember the time in town meeting in the 80s when um, uh, Mr. Carpenter, uh, would, uh, who was the uh, head of uh, schools buildings, would come to town meeting and tell us that such and such a school needed a new roof. And he would explain why. And because we knew him to be honest and straightforward, uh, we would generally go along uh, with his recommendation. So I've got a lot of questions about what's going on, um, 
with the state legislature appointing these various authorities, the governor appoints the commissioners, um, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we want to take a good look at it. Thank you. Um, more discussion. Um, yes, gentleman right there in the green shirt. Uh, Jim Barat, uh, Precinct 1. Uh, I know we voted uh, 400000 last year for the boilers. We voted 400000 for boilers last year. Now, if we spend this 400000 for part of the um, uh, ongoing, you know, uh, feasibility study, whatever you want to call it, what about the boilers? Don't we need them? Have they been, they haven't been replaced, so I presume we didn't need them when you asked us for it last year. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bahani. So, uh, thank you. The, the boilers are in need. What we've done is we have, four, we asked last year for $400,000 to replace the boilers in the Wildwood School. I showed you a couple pictures in the end there. There were a couple enormous boilers. They were white in color with uh, black fronts. They, they actually had like the holes where you can shovel the coal in them. Um, they are in dire need of being replaced. There is a huge um, energy savings, approximately fifty to $70,000 per year to replace those in, in energy conservation. But what we've done is, is in lieu of that, you're gonna, we have another article beyond here, which is Article 18, which is to rescind that boiler money to pay for the feasibility because if we go forward with a feasibility and we go forward with a renovation, addition, whatever the feasibility shows us, we're gonna replace those boilers. And instead of paying $400,000 for those boilers, the town will pay $160,000 because the state will reimburse us at our reimbursement rate. One other key point I'd just like to share with you, which I think is very important. The MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority's money, where does it come from? They do not have to lobby for their money like other organizations do. One cent of every single tax dollar that we, the, the, the sales tax, your 6.25% or whatever it is, one cent of that goes to the MSBA automatically. So that's where their revenue stream comes from. And I wish I had it, but it's, it's, it's they've, they've, they've earned like $43 billion or something like that. So the funding is there, which is very exciting. Um, yes, way in the back there. Thank you. Um, Jerry Weiss, Precinct 8. I'm just interested in the, because um, I don't know a lot about this, the nuts and bolts. Um, I'm assuming that a million dollars buys people, it's time. How many people uh, are going to be hired and how long does it take them? It's a lot of money. I'm just curious how it gets spent. Mr. Bahana. Well, the first thing I just want to say is that the, the very first thing of the process is we have to go out for a bid. We have to go out for a request for proposal. We're asking for a million dollars based on what other communities have paid and or have done. So we've set the million dollars is a budget is where we've come from. So what we will hire is we will hire architectural firms, engineering firms, um, and I can't give you a specific amount of people, but it's, it's those firms that will assess the, the, the facilities, assess the programs, and then assess what the outcome may be and give us some kind of documentation from that. So it could vary from, it could vary from, you know, 10 to 30 people. Thank you. Um, yes, the woman in the red right there on the aisle. Jacqueline Maidana. Precinct 5. I'm also concerned about the million dollars for a feasibility uh, study. It, it seems to me that that's a lot of money for something that we already really know needs to be fixed. They need to remodel or something. Uh, my children went to that school, and it was a horrible experience for them. 
So I, I certainly would vote for it, but uh, I just feel that, I, I thought I heard somebody say that it was gonna be three years, a three year study. Um, that seemed, um, is that accurate? Mr. Bahano. Yes, um, two things. One, I wanna remind folks, what we're asking for is a million with anticipation from the state for a reimbursement of approximately 60%, 59.XXX. So out-of-pocket expense to the town should result, if we were to spend the million, it would result in 400,000 out-of-pocket expense to the town. So that, that's the first thing. As far as the time frame, it will take us, it will take a year to do an assessment of the feasibility part. And then from that, we, we have to do whatever our next steps are. So if you were to, what, what the three year process would be is to have an end product. So somewhere in about three years, we could have a renovation, an addition, or whatever came out of the feasibility. The feasibility process should only take about a year. Thanks. Um, way, way in the back there, yes. Bonnie McCracken, um, Precinct 6. Um, yes, it's a million dollars, a lot of money. My first child went to Fort River in 1980 and I graduated my last one in 2010. We did a lot of wear and tear on Fort River. But um, my question is, is that, you know, we have a declining enrollment. We talk about losing family and young children in this town. Will we really need another school? Will we be looking at closing a school? We are also looking at regionalization in our elementary school. And we'll have two more schools for which our children can go to. North Amherst could go to Leverett. Some people could go to, some children could go to Shutesbury. I think we're a little premature looking, looking at this until we decide what we're going to do with the regional schools in the elementary and with this, you know, decreasing population amongst our young families. Thank you, Mr. Morris. So even to be eligible for the feasibility study, um, Kathy Mazur in Human Resources, we've sent a lot of um, demographic information. We have projections going out 10 years on exactly the types of questions that you asked. And I think that's one of the reasons in the feasibility study we're going to look at do we need three elementary schools in Amherst in the future? Do we need two? And that would have large implications of what the recommendation would be. So I think you're right to say that we need to look at the declining enrollment, and we are, and I th that will yield a result based on the feasibility study, looking at enrollments, capacity of schools, um, long term, what would be the best solution for this plan? So it's, it's possible that the MSBA will say, look at our enrollments and say, you need two schools, and this is how what we would recommend and that's really what the feasibility study does, take the long-term demographics, the long-term um, looking at the space and the size. And I th the other thing I wanna share is that regardless of demographics and enrollments, um, we're gonna need more than one school in Amherst. <laughs> and both two of our schools in Amherst have many of these similar problems. So I do believe regardless of the fact that we have declining enrollment, we are going to benefit, our kids will benefit from having two schools that are fully functional for their educational needs. Um, yes, third row from the back right there. Mary Streeter, Precinct 8. <coughs> um, I'm very concerned about the cost of the study and what comes to mind is that Amherst tends to have a lot of studies. I'm just wondering are there other towns that you know of that have funded million dollar studies for one building. And I also wanna offer a comment from my experience right after Wildwood was built as a teacher in the school system. Uh, those of us from Crocker Farm were asked to visit Wildwood to offer comments because they were in the process of planning the Fort River School. And most of us said this would be a terrible situation to teach in Four quad, you know, a quad with four classrooms in it is not good for distractible children, or probably not good for any children. Uh, we weren't listened to. And so I'm very concerned. I tend to go toward being practical, and I think that 
having um, input from teachers and parents is particularly important. Uh, not just having input because it's a pro forma step to go through, but input where you really value what they say. I think that what they have to say is just as important as what any engineers and other people like that have to say. So um, I, I, I'm still kind of struck by the um, classrooms, the modular classrooms that we had to purchase for, while, for uh, Mark's Meadow School. We're still paying for, someone just said. Um, we need to be practical. So the idea that Amherst came up with the total cost of this study would be a million dollars. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and also to know how that million dollar study, even though we're only paying 400,000 of it, how that compares with what other towns would do. I, I must say also, I fully recognize that Wildwood does need these repairs. I, I've, I've been there and 10 years ago, bef shortly before I retired, we had some workshops there and I, I found myself feeling that it, I had um, breathing issues there and I just felt that the school itself really was in need of repair. Mr. Bahadur. Yes, thank you. There's a, there is a tremendous amount of information on what we call the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority website. You can see everything that every other district in the state of Massachusetts has done and what they've paid for things, the cost of buildings and so forth. I did, uh, uh, in the presentation here, um, the town of Milford spent a million dollars, the town of Abington spent $800,000, Brookline spent $1.75 million, and South Hadley, our neighbor, who just did a little, uh, a, a little elementary school, spent $750,000. So uh, what I did when we came up with the million, I kind of looked at schools that were comparable in size, comparable in square foot, and then I took those dollar amounts and looked at them and said, well, they've been paying about this amount of money for a feasibility study. And then I had discussion with the Massachusetts School Building Authority folks and asked them, what have you been seeing? What's coming in? And then they talked about uh, it, how elaborate do you want the study? And some of these things that we've discussed tonight, which are we want to look at the school, all three elementary schools as a whole, and we want to look at possibly the reconfiguration. So therefore, the MSBA said, I think it, you'd, be, you'd be safe with asking for a million dollars. And the other reason we're asking for a million dollars is, I don't want to say to you, it's going to be $600,000 and then have to come back here in June and say, uh-oh, it's another 400,000. Um, we will do our due diligence and we will try to get the most economical um, study that we possibly can and try to cover all the bases. To the second part of the question, this, the, the building committee has to have on it, we've already submitted this to the state, the state has requirements of who's on that committee and teachers have to be on that committee, principals have to be on that committee, the people, parents have to be on that committee, not just a bunch of engineers or a bunch of architects. So uh, we have a committee and we have actually have it set up we have people that we've asked uh, to be on it. We have people that are parents and that are, are architects, and we also have teachers on the committee right now. We can add to the committee at any time. We have to, we have to give them, I believe it's 40 days notice that we wanna add or take somebody off of our committee. Thank you. Um, yes, third row up on the aisle, blue shirt, please. Rabud Lukash, Precinct 10. And um, my question is that um, this study, this feasibility study will lead for us to be able to know how to spend a lot more money possibly, um, supposedly, towards the school to renew the building or, or do something else. Does this million dollars cover design work? So do we end up um, at the end of a successful study, we just might we just the best options or also a blueprint, blueprint of what to do. Mr. Bahanovitz. We, we will end up with what they call a schematic design, a very uh, preliminary type of design. It's not all of the details of the doors and the hardware and what size are they and that kind of stuff. What it will show you is this is what the building or the renovation may look like. Uh, so it's, it's just a, um, a 
like I don't want to say a pencil drawing because it's not a pencil drawing. It is actually CAD drawings, but it's 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 basic CAD drawings. It doesn't get down to the specific materials used in the construction. It, it would, it, Mr. Pooler is Mr. Pooler has been through this in another district as well already, and it will give you what he said to me is it will give you classroom classroom sizes. Uh, it'll it'll show you restrooms where they are, it'll show you hallways, entry points, that type of stuff. Thank you. Um, it's way over against the wall there in the vest. <coughs> Russ Vernon Jones, Precinct 5. Uh, I can certainly say that the Fort River and Wildwood buildings uh, need replacement or renovation. Uh, they, they have serious needs. At the same time, we keep hearing about reconfiguration, uh, and one of the handouts that was available on the back table uh, is one that lays out one of the possibilities, which is that perhaps all pre-K through one students would be at Crocker Farm from the entire town, uh, and a new school would be created, would be built, uh, taking second through sixth graders from the entire town. Now, I'm not going to stand here tonight and say whether I think that makes sense or not, but I certainly want those decisions being made by educators. And I think if we are going to vote money for a feasibility study, which will be driven primarily by architects and number people, even if there are some teachers on the committee, I think our school committee uh, and other people need to begin a very serious study of what the ideal sizes are for elementary schools, uh, what's going to make the most uh, the, the best educational environments, not just what's going to work in terms of bus routes and uh, how the dollars and numbers of classrooms and numbers of students fit. Right? We need to be thinking educationally about these things uh, and get out ahead of uh, the, the uh, people doing the, the numbers study on how to house students. We need to be educating them, not just putting them in buildings. Thank you. Yes, on the aisle here in the blue shirt. Um, a million dollars seems like a lot I'm to sorry, me. I'm sorry, identify yourself, oh, please. Uh, Dale Chapman, Precinct 7. Um, I'm really not in favor of spending a million dollars for a study. Uh, this town is full of educators, and we have <coughs> lots of architectural firms, and I think the uniqueness of the educational system in this country what's made it so strong is its local nature. And all the years that I taught in this system, I always felt I would just as soon give all the money back to the state and let us run our school the way we'd like to. Um, I don't see the need, I really don't trust experts to understand what we as a community want. And it seems to me we could take that million dollars and talk to the teachers at Wildwood and the students at Wildwood and use that million dollars to make the renovations ourselves. So I'm not in favor of this. Thank you. Um, yes, second row over there. Um, microphone. Uh, Robert Wellman, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, just close to your mouth. Okay. Uh, my name is Robert Wellman, Precinct um, 7. Um, finally, with the last three speakers, the conversation seems to have switched into a much more uh, fruitful uh, uh, line of thinking. Namely, uh, this is an educational proposal. It's an educational study we're proposing. And up until that time, namely three speakers ago, nothing had been said about education. Uh, I would urge, incidentally, I, I, I agree with a lot that has been said, and I certainly will vote in favor of a feasibility study. But the, the feasibility must be its educational fe feasibility and whether or not uh, uh, these matters uh, that are being discussed can fulfill the educational needs both of the community 
and of our population. Uh, I recall when, um, oh, which one was built first? Uh, when uh, Wildwood and uh, Fort River were built. And uh, mainly what was discussed at that time was whether or not this open landscape being uh, proposed where you would have four classes, I believe that's what they had, uh, four classes in a large room and cut down. And I've been interested uh, 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 this evening to see that in fact over the years uh, they've gone back to cutting it down and cutting it back and making it more into uh, something resembling a self-contained classroom. Uh, I don't regret what occurred uh, in um, Fort River and uh, Wildwood, and I'm sure that there was a lot of uh, very worthwhile uh, uh <coughs> knowledge gained from trying out something different and something new. And I equally hope that we don't go back and come up with an architectural design that in fact has small cubicles for individual, uh, uh, for individual um, uh, classrooms. However, I do believe that there is, as suggested by the previous speaker, there's a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of study have, uh, studies have been done to suggest what kinds of programs can work best and what kinds of programs probably will not work very well, especially in our unique situations. And I say unique not because our community is unique, every community is unique, and we are also, but only as Dale Chapman pointed out uh, earlier, or, or just a minute ago, uh, uh, the ones who are really in a position to make these decisions are is, is members of the community and the teachers. And, uh, and again, we have a lot of people around here that will be happy to serve as, um, as consultants or whatever you need. Uh, go onto the campuses and just ask. And uh, <laughs> they'll come out to do their service portion of whatever it is they're supposed to be doing these days. Okay, I'm sorry to take so long, but uh, I think this is a good idea, but I do hope that a lot more thought is put into what will constitute a feasibility study. Thank you. Mr. Morris. So just briefly, um, as we look at a feasibility study, the very first thing that is on the deliverables is the educational program. So not only are teachers and parents and myself, the superintendent, um, folks from the educational world locally involved, that's what these people do. They're not, I, I think when you think about architects, these are people who specialize in building schools or renovating schools. They're aware of the current research and I agree that we have so many um, local resources to help us with this, but what we're interested in is making sure that we have the best educational environment for students. That has an architectural and uh, technical component to it uh, but the end is the educational experience for our kids that we wanted to improve. And so we are very aware of that. We're very cognizant of that. If you look at our building committee, with all due respect to Mr. Bahanowitz, it's mostly people who are interested in the education field um, and not people on the technical side because we want to make sure it's the right fit for our students in our community. So I, I agree with many of the comments last speaker and I just want to clarify that I know some of the technical pieces are what's getting presented because that's part of what the study is but it's all in the effort for the educational experience for kids. Thank you. Um, yes, in the blue jacket right there. Jane Wald, Precinct One. Um, I think a lot of our discussion this evening, um, I think there's sort of two different discussions going on. One, one has to do with the amount of money and the other has to do with um, really what the educational program is going to be. I trust our school committee uh, and our school personnel and our town personnel not to ignore education as they look to the future of our schools. Um, I also think that uh, we're getting a little bit hung up on the word fe 
feasibility. Um, and I think feasibility, uh, I, I've, done, I've been involved in feasibility studies myself with capital projects, and um, it, it, there's really a lot of um, assessment, a lot of uh, detailed research that goes, into, that goes into defining the program that belongs in a building. Uh, and all of this, I am absolutely sure, is going to be part of this process. And uh, I look forward to the opportunity all of us will have to contribute to that process. Finally, um, I am really not willing to turn my back on state funds uh, of this magnitude uh, if, if the feasibility study, um, if it costs, I mean, I'm happy to think of it as a $400,000 feasibility study. And if that's what it costs us to arrive at an outcome uh, as important as the one we're aiming for, which includes thinking long-term about our school buildings, our school population, uh, and uh, looking toward the future, um, I'm happy to spend that $400,000. We get it, it, that's a bargain for this kind of work. Um, finally, um, I, I, I just wanna, I just wanna urge us to um, approve this article. Um, I think it's in our best interest. We've, we've talked a lot also about um, the flight of families with young children from our town. Um, we've all, many of us have recognized this evening the condition of the two largest elementary schools in our town. Now that's not really gonna bring in young families with children. It's not gonna retain families with young children. Uh, so I think it's high time for us to get started on looking toward the future uh, of a diverse and forward-looking population for Amherst. Um, yes, right there in the center. Andy Churchill, Precinct 3, I call the question. Motion for the previous question has been made. We will now come to a vote to end debate and proceed to a vote on the motion that's before you. This is a two-thirds vote, the motion for the previous question. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. No. Um, moderator hears two-thirds. Okay. Um, I hear doubts, we will have a standing vote. Tellers, all six of you still here? Listen, one, two, three, four, five, six, yes. All those in favor of the motion for the previous question, please rise and remain standing. On the right, there are 55 zero yes votes. You may be seated on the right. Okay. 
On the left, there are 29 yes votes. You may be seated on the left. Thirty-three yes votes in the center. You may be seated. All those opposed to the motion for the previous question, please rise and remain standing. On the right, there are three no votes. On the right, there are three no votes. You may be seated. In the center, there are seven no votes. You may be seated. On the left, there are 17 no votes. You may be seated. Totals are 120, 112 yes votes, 27 no votes. We have achieved a two-thirds majority. Therefore, we will now come to an immediate vote on the motion before you, which is also a two-thirds vote. All those in favor of the motion under Article 17, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. no. The moderator here is two-thirds. Two-thirds vote. And we now move on to Article 18. And I call on Ms. Tileman to make a motion. Um, we didn't hear you. I move in terms of the article. Motion has been made and second. And the motion is to see if the town will vote to rescind the 400,000 unissued amount voted under Article 21 at the 2013 annual town meeting. Made and seconded, you may speak to your motion. It, it is in your finance committee booklet. Thank you. Um, and the finance committee recommendation? The finance committee recommends this motion by a vote of five uh, to zero with one abstention. Thank you. And Mr. Wald for the select board. Thank you. On April 7th, the select board voted unanimously to recommend this article, what she said. Thank you. <laughs> and this requires a majority to pass. Is there discussion before we come to a vote? Um, Yes, there. Uh, 
two questions for Mr. Verhanowitz. Um, a, uh, how I'm sorry, identify yourself. I'm sorry, Chris Riddle, Precinct 2. Um, uh, how the best guess is that the new schools that will come out of this study might be here in five years, maybe? Let's say six years, five, six years, something like that. Uh, first, you buy that, and then secondly, is it worth buying these boilers and and cutting, and reducing our energy consumption, reducing our carbon production for uh, five years or six years, and uh, and then reusing them in the new building? I don't see why they can't be reused. Um, Mr. Bahanowitz, you want to speak to that? Boilers are um, what we call number two fuel oil boilers. Uh, we have been repairing them and keeping them running for the last several years. We have two boilers in the Wildwood building. Uh, one predominantly can handle most of the load through the winter season. And then what happens, the other one kicks in. So we have what they call redundancy. <coughs> and that's the, that was the way they designed them back in the 70s. Nowadays, uh, the new boilers are uh, much more efficient. They're called modulating and so forth. We were going to convert them to natural gas, and the savings would be anywhere from, as I said before, fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year in savings. Uh, we chose to uh, not burden the town with as much more borrowing. We we thought it'd be the best interest to uh, forego this money on those boilers, keep them running for the next three three to five years, and. Uh, get the new boilers at a price of 160 versus uh, 400,000. So what Mr. Riddle said is, yeah, we could go buy them, we could put them in, we could reuse them, uh, but we, we kind of opted out of that and we decided that we'd keep them running. Thanks. Um, yes, right here, second row. It, Janet Chevin, Precinct 7. My question is similar to Mr. Riddle's, but um, I, I'm wondering why we need tonight to rescind that vote. What if we aren't going to get the feasibility money? What if we decide not to build another building? I mean, there are so many what ifs. We can keep this vote from last year not spend the money, but if we suddenly need to, we have it. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to me as though we should rescind it tonight. We could do it next year or the year after. Um, anybody on the Finance Committee or Mr. Bahanowitz want to explain that? Uh, Mr. Pooler. <laughs> the idea is to rescind is that uh, we don't want to be in a position of spending the same money twice if at some point we needed money for the boilers down the road, we would obviously have to come back and, and do that. But to say that we have the money set aside just in case, I think isn't really true if we go and spend $400,000 on the feasibility study and that $400,000 is gone. We would then have to have a plan, whatever that 50 plan would be, if at some point Ron said, we just can't keep going with these boilers, the school's not gonna get built, whatever. We would come back, incorporate the new cost into the JCPC plan, into our long-term capital plan. Um, it may be it's the same number, it may be a different number, but I think we would have the flexibility to do that at the time we need it. That would be my uh, argument. And then furthermore, it's just, if we're not gonna borrow, it's better to get it off of our books. Yes, and right here in the center in the black. Vera Duangani, Precinct 7. I'm looking at the Mass School Buildings website, massschoolbuildings.org, and there is um, a program called Accelerated Repair Program, which covers boilers, window, roof, and other items. Would, would we be able to access some of that um, programming and what sort of funding assistance would be provided? Have we looked into that? Mr. Bonnets. Uh, I am familiar with that program and that is the program that we got the windows here in the, uh, in the middle school for. What you, in order to qualify the, for that program, 
your school can only need one of the following things, either a boiler, windows, a roof, one of them. It can't encompass and need multiple things. If it, it, that's on the accelerated repair program. If it needs multiple things, then we have to do this filing for the SOI as we are. I can also say that I applied, we are in the middle of uh, bids for the high school boilers uh, under the regional capital plan. I applied for the acceleration repair program to the state and I was denied. Thank you. Um, yes, in the back corner there. Uh, Vince O'Connor, Precinct 1. Um, so, uh, my, the math, it seems to me, is this. We save 70000 a year if we replace the boilers. We also, environmentally, um, do a better job, uh, and probably a significantly better job. Um, if, if we actually have a building in place after three years, which I think is not likely, we save 210 out of the 400 we've spent. If more likely we have a building in place after five years, we will have saved almost the entire amount that we spent, $350,000. If it goes to six, we will actually save more than we've spent on the boilers, plus um, having done the right thing environmentally. Um, I don't understand, um, given the, that math, I, I just don't agree with rescinding this. I think we ought to spend the money um, be, and make sure that those boilers are transferable to whatever structure um, may, uh, may uh, result from the feasibility study. Mr. Slug. So I would, I would suggest the following, is that uh, the, the size and type of boiler that we would need for the current construction of, uh, the current construction that exists at Wildwood School is one thing. What we may come out of a feasibility study with could be a larger building, could be a smaller building, could be a much different building from a heating and cooling standpoint. So the nature and quality, quantity and such of the design of those boilers in, in that new structure could be considerably different from what would be appropriate for the building we have right now. So I think that's also part and parcel of why waiting uh, to decide on, on whether we need them or not or, or how long and that sort of thing until the feasibility study is done is a, is a wise move financially. Thank you. Um, yes, over there. Boiling Greeny, Precinct 10. I agree with the uh, previous speaker uh, about uh, spending the money to do the boiler now. And just very basic, you know, $70,000 savings uh, from the oil uh, cost. And over a five year period, you will have saved $350,000. And plus, it's the right thing to do from the environmental standpoint of view. So we don't know whether the school will be built or be renovated, that's a lot of ifs. But what it's not ifs, what's certain is you will have $70,000 of savings per year and the environmental no, uh, footprint from the carbon dioxide point of view, it's a sure thing. So the certainty versus the uncertainty of whether to, re whether to renovate or to rebuild. So in my mind, I would encourage that we spend the money to purchase the boiler, replace it, and do the right thing both from the economical and from the ecological point of view. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind the meeting that if you hold up a red or a green card, a green card would indicate that you're in favor of the motion before you and red opposed. And I do use that to try and pick a fair balance of people, so try and be accurate with that. Mr. Masanti. Yeah, I, I just want to say I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the questioning and uh, the type of questioning that the last couple of speakers have uh, uh, the issues they've raised are the same questions I had. And uh, uh, in discussions with uh, Mr. Bohanowitz, our facilities director, and then review with uh, uh, Sandy Pooler and the Joint Capital Planning Committee, uh, uh, if in fact we end up with a different, differently 
different boiler, differently configured boiler, we haven't saved money at all. We've actually spent more money than we would if we waited a couple of years and had the state pay 60% of the cost of whatever boiler we need to put in uh, at the Wildwood School. So the, the motion that's before you is to try to encourage you to help us save the town a lot of money. Thank you. Um, yes, right there in the center in the red. Marilyn Blostein, Precinct 6, I call the previous question. Yes. Motion for the previous question has been made and seconded. We will now come to immediate vote. If this passes by two-thirds, we will come to a vote on the motion before you. All those in favor of motion for the previous question, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Aye. The ayes have it by two-thirds. We now come to a vote on the motion before you, which is to rescind the $400,000. This requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the motion to rescind, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. no. I hear a majority. It passes. I call on Mr. Hayden. I'm going to muster up the energy to move. Oh, can't hear you, can't hear you. Uh, I'm going to get even closer. I'm going to muster up the energy to move that we continue debate, even though it's after 10 o'clock. Um, are we ready to come to a vote on the motion to continue debate? <laughs> All those in favor of continuing debate and moving on to the next article, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. no. Mr. Hayden, would you try I another move, motion? I move to adjourn until Monday. I hear a second. I think I hear a second. Did I hear a second? second. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say no. We are adjourned. Thank you. Let's be here promptly next week, folks.